This episode of The Candid Frame is sponsored by the Charcoal Book Club. The Charcoal Book Club is the monthly subscription service for photo book enthusiasts. Working with the most respected names in contemporary photography, Charcoal selects and delivers essential photo books to a worldwide community of collectors. Each month, members receive a signed first edition monograph and an exclusive print to add to their collections. Join the club by visiting charcoalbookclub.com and use the promo code VCANDIDFRAME at checkout and receive a 10% discount on your first membership payment. Back in 2019, I interviewed photographer Gulnara Samaliova about her founding of Women Street Photographers, a collection of hundreds of women who share a passion for street photography. What began as one woman's inspiration has turned into a community that has showcased and inspired photographers the world over. The annual exhibits have displayed amazing work that break through any assumed limitations of sexuality and locality. The recent release of the book Women Street Photographers provides a new way for that talent to be displayed and shared. And today we speak to two photographers who were included in that monograph. The first is Melissa Breyer, who also provides the foreword to the book. Her work consists of ongoing themed projects, including True Stories, Watchwomen, and City of Clouds. Emily Sujay Sanchez is a relative newcomer to the world of street photography. Her focus on the Latinx communities of Upper Manhattan and the Bronx results in rich photographs of an overlooked community, especially among street photographers. They are only two of numerous talents whose work can be found in this seminal book. This is Ibarion X, and welcome back to The Candid Frame. First off, congratulations on the book. It is... Thank you. Uh, Gulnara did a fantastic job putting it She's together. Good. Yeah. I know it's a lot of work. God knows. Especially wrangling that many photographers. Especially right. street photographers. <laughs> I don't. I don't, I don't know how she her. did it. Yeah, I don't know how she did it. It was a real feat, but she's supernatural, so right, it makes sense. So yeah. how how did you become involved with her? Because I think I don't. I forget how long ago she started women's street photographers. But tell me about how each of you found out about her and how you got involved in the community that she built. She found me on Instagram and asked me to join the group um, or that she wanted to share a picture of mine. I forget the early days before the first show. And uh, I, could just, I just couldn't believe it. We had tried to get a group of women street photographers together in New York before. And um, it was a, a nice little effort, but it didn't quite pan out the way that Gunara's group did. So that group kind of got folded into her group because she, Gunara is so dynamic and such a force of nature, and she just made everything happen. I joined the, followed the page then and was in the first show, and I think every show after that, and we just became friends because also one of the things that this group does is meets well before the pandemic. We would meet once a month and have kind of a potluck dinner at somebody's house. So it was a real, it was a really neat way to start to get to meet people and get everything off of social media just have some face-to-face time that we, we, a lot of us bonded through that. And how about you, Emily? Right. A good friend of mine had contacted me. This was like two years ago um, and said, Hey, there's this amazing women's street photography show going on. I think you should check it out. You know, go take a look. And I did. The show was in Harlem at the gallery uh, PS 109 in Harlem. And um, I went to the show beautiful experience, amazing photographs. And I remember standing in front of the sign that said Women Street Photographers. And I stood in front of it. I took a selfie and I told myself, one day I am going to be part of this show. <laughs> I don't know when, <laughs> but but I am. I was waiting you know, thinking that perhaps in the fall there would be a call, you know, for the show. But it was like within weeks after visiting the show that I started following Women's Street Photographers and she posted um, that she was doing an open call and I submitted my work. And then fast forward spring, I had an honorable mention, was selected 
then to be part of the show. And she invited me to come to one of these potluck dinners that Mel was talking about. So that's when we started our, our relationship. What has been one of the more important aspects of, of having this, having this community for each of you? Well, for me, I would say is instilling confidence and believing in my work and having a group of women around me that, you know, love what they do and seeing that as an example to me, to me has been that. Yeah, I can definitely see that. I think also for me, there's just a sense of community. So there's a lot of street photography community around, but it's mostly kind of a boys club. No offense to the men, but having this community of strong, talented, great women all together um, was just so inspiring. And especially, you know, I come from older New York kind of art scene where people would go to people's studios and hang out and talk about art and with social media, which is so, so great, but there's not so much of that face to face and it's the community is just different. So having this kind of strong face to face community has been really, really cool. For me, when I've gotten into, you know, groups where either because of culture or race or some, some other sort of linkage, it, it's nice to be within a group where I don't have to explain myself or justify myself. Is that something, another benefit of being being in the group, especially as an artist and a photographer? Yeah, definitely. I, I would say that that's definitely true. And how about for you? I, I agree. I agree. It's women who are on the same, you know, course, which is producing work and amazing works and being able to support, you know, one another, one way or another. You know, one of the things I really loved about your um, your forward to the book was when you were going over sort of the history of, of photography and, and 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 different seminal women and, and different points in there. And I, I liked that it kind of paralleled the rights and the freedoms that women developed over time and, and sort of paralleled that with with the history of photography. And yeah. And yeah. I thought that, that was really interesting, especially when you you know, when you start, you know, we start with that anecdote from the very beginning. Talk about that and and why you decided to write, you know, the forward uh, in that particular way. Well I was really interested in in a history that we don't hear very much about. Um, we hear all about the the male street photographers and all the iconic, you know, Brisson and all of the of the icons, and we don't hear very much about the women street photographers. And I thought, do they even exist? Are they even there? So I wanted to go back, since thankfully the history of photography is not that long. I knew I could kind of go back to the beginning and really see like where were they? What were the women doing back then? Because I figured there had to be women doing photography, but we don't hear about them. I really just started looking at looking for the the first first woman street photographer and first woman photographer and um, the first street photograph and just kind of making this putting everything in context and I found as I started going along that there were just all of these parallels with with women's rights and with the technology of photography and women going out there and making photographs and it just completely coalesced into this narrative for me. So it kind of, the story kind of told itself. People often talk about the, the, the advancement in technology, like going from these sort of large glass plate, metal plate cameras into more compact, portable, and how that provided a better means for people to sort of navigate the streets with the camera. But uh, yeah. that didn't stop some of the women that you noted in the book from going out there and making the photographs. And I yeah, thought that was I just know. amazing, especially at a time where where just being out there with a camera, period, especially a large camera like that, made you kind of an anomaly. But on top of that, being a woman, that's sort of the takeaway uh, for me is how women then and now just take ownership of of the fact that I want to make this kind of work and I don't care what other people say or whether that or not they or even myself, or I feel like I'm represented. This is what I want to do. And I think that's a really sort of powerful thing. And I think it's really reinforced not only in, in the book, but as I suspect the community that you guys have, have built together. Tell me about when you were sort of starting off as, as, as quote unquote street photographers about that idea of finding your, 
your place in that and and feeling like oh, yeah this is this is my thing this is something I, I feel like I'm meant to do I didn't even really know I think this is experience of a lot of people I didn't know that I was doing street photography I was doing travel photography and then I was doing what I thought was travel photography at home and I didn't realize that there was a thing called street photography because I just hadn't at the time hadn't had a very extensive background in the history of photography I was a fine arts historian and decorative arts historian so I was doing street photography which I didn't know was called street photography and I was on Facebook and I started sharing some of my photos and um, everyone's like oh wow you're a street photographer I'm like I am Okay. And then I started f finding groups, the street photography group. I just, it, it all completely clicked at that point. You know, I've always been a visual artist, so it didn't, I, I never felt this challenge like that. I, and, and being especially in, in New York city, which is just everything goes. Um, I never felt like a real challenge. Like I wasn't in my place or this was not a, a thing that women would do. I was just doing it. And I felt like the street photography community was very, very welcoming. And you, Emily? And for me, I, I want to say it's probably something along those lines. I really didn't have some label. I know that I was out taking photographs and it wasn't really in, until people started saying, oh, you do street photography or you're a street photographer. And then the label of women, a woman street photographer, um, it wasn't, yeah, until then that I realized, okay, well, yeah, this is, this is what I do. But um, also thinking that I wanna move more into, I feel like I'm documenting. Like for me, that's my experience. What I'm doing is that I'm I'm documenting my experiences, the things that I see, the things that I love, things that represent me. And then I came to to know that there is, you know, documentary work as well. So, um, so yeah. So it's basically just coming along the lines of somebody, you know, saying you're a street photographer. It, it's easy for I guess people who come to street photography now to assume that it's primarily an aesthetic pr a practice. It's about creating really cool images with light and shadow or, you know, stuff like that. So much is informed by, you know, the photojournalism practice and documentary practice. It's like the, the street photography to some extent is, is either influenced or is derived from, from that. And um, when I looked for the images in, in the book, uh, so much of the work that I saw produced and a lot of the uh, people that you talked about in your in your forward were about photographing communities, cultures, uh, events that were within the orbit of of the photographers who were making the photographs. It wasn't about just going to some destination because it has cool light or because it has interesting characters. I know not only that your work uh, really kind of focuses on on your community in in New York. Tell me about the drive. And what inspires you in terms of turning your camera to spaces that are very familiar with you uh, rather than going to somewhere else just because it's a hot place to go to make photographs? Right. It's just, it's important for me. It's important for me to document people that look for me, uh, that look like me, because as we all know for such a long time and still, it's sort of hard to find ourselves you know, in, in places that I feel we rightfully belong. You know, it's just, it's important. Representation is important. That's just uh, at the bottom line. I want to ensure that I can capture my community in an honest way, in an honorable way, you know, in, in a beautiful way that when you are able to look at a book, at a picture, anywhere that you are able to see yourself and be proud of, of that. So for me, it is just really, you know, to ensure that, that we're, we're represented. I interviewed Melissa O'Shaughnessy, who's in the book, uh, love, which is an amazing book in and of itself. She's a wonderful photographer. But one of the things that we discussed in terms of how her images were different, it was, it was her height that created a much different experience in, in the photographs. And I really noticed that. And she said that that's a comment that's been made by other photographers. 
in terms of her relative perspective to what was happening, created a, a, enough of a difference that the experience of seeing the images was unlike other other things that I had seen. And that's just relative to the height. But, you know, it's always, I'm kind of curious as to what aspects of you being women out in the street results in imagery that, that's different or results in a different a different approach. Can, you know, may not be simply relegated to the fact that you're women, but is there some aspect of the physicality, the way that you're in, the, the interaction that you think results in photographs that are somehow a little bit distinctive? Melissa, I'd love to start with you. It's a really good question, and I think about it a lot, and I, I'm not quite sure. I'm very, very non-confrontational in life, and especially in street photography, so I would never take photos where... I'm going to make somebody uncomfortable or be in their face or use flash. Um, and I don't know if that can be called a gender decision because I'm a woman. I'm, I try to kind of be a little more behind the scenes. Yeah. So I don't, I, I'm not really sure. And I know some women street photographers who are very aggressive. Uh, and I know men street photographers who are also very kind of subtle and try to disappear into the background. So it's kind of hard to generalize like that. I'm always trying to capture a mood. So it's very expressive. It's very ar artistic. It's m a little more artsy than documentary, my photographs. But I, I don't necessarily think that's gender specific either. But it is uh, It is like I have a very strong hunger to capture a mood. So for whatever that's worth. I usually describe the kind of two approaches there are for street photography. And it's used by a lot of people. It's either being a, a fisherman or a hunter. You know, in terms of the fisherman is the kind of person who looks at a scene, kind of evaluates it, evaluates it for its potential for light and line and shape, and then waits for things to sort of converge in a moment to present itself. And there are other people that just like they're moving like sharks. You know, <laughs> they're 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 looking for it and just like you know leap out like a panther to grab grab the shot. Which of those two are you? If if not completely, how much would you say you're one versus the other? I, I think I would say I'm a little bit more of a fisherman, but I don't, I'm more of a, I let the moment happen. I'm there. The moment is happening and I'm capturing this moment that just occurred in front of me. I don't so much, my process is not so much as I'm going to go out to see you know, what I can find and at sunset when I know or the golden hour or, or, or whatever it is, it's just more of like, I let the magic happen. <laughs> How about you, Melissa? Yeah. I would say I'm kind of in between. Uh, I'm probably a little more of a fisher woman person, um, but I'm not very patient. So I maybe have the pace more of a hunter. I have the pace of a hunter, but the mindset of a, of a fisher. <laughs> I don't have patience to sit around. I know some people can just sit around for the longest time and wait for the perfect person to walk into the perfect scene. And I, I admire that, but I just don't have the patience. Right. Someone said that to me. I, this is an assignment for you. Stand in a corner and just sit there and wait and watch. And I was like, no, I can't. <laughs> I can't just sit here for like hours on end. No, I just, I will walk and I will run into my moment that I will capture. Yeah, I've waited on a spot for 45 minutes for something. <laughs> and sometimes it's paid off and sometimes it's not. And it's like, you know, you feel like, oh, I should leave. I should leave now. Just give up. And now just give it another 10 minutes. <laughs> right, well, think about it. I would be like, 45 minutes? You know how many magical moments I could have captured in 45 minutes, perhaps? Oh, you got to give that up. You got to give that up because I go, you know, that thought of, oh, it'll be better around the corner. Because I've had so many times where I just, just as I leave, it happens. Mm. And I go, damn it. I should have stayed there. <laughs> there. But I think one of the things that's kind of interesting, regardless of sex, is this idea of finding what your approach is. Because a lot of people, especially on YouTube, are, are, are sharing their techniques and their sort of approaches. It, it, you know, there's no singular way of being able to do this. Uh, whether you're fishing or whether you're hunting or something in between. For me, it's, it was really important to find something that worked for me. Because if I tried to do something that was not natural to me, it made the whole process of just being present and making photographs almost impossible. 
So I really would love to talk about how each of you sort of found, you know, your fit in terms of like, yeah, I'm hearing it all these different approaches and all these techniques, and this is the lens you should use. And, you know, this is the camera you can use. And these are the settings. And finally just say, that's just too much. My head is going to explode. <laughs> this is the way I'm going to do it. So tell me about that journey and, and what, you know, how you came to finding that space for yourself. I'll go. <laughs> when I talked about joining Facebook for the first time and, and being introduced to the world of street photography, it opened up this huge world. And I saw all these different styles that people were doing. I, I was really kind of like, everything was so shiny and new. I was really attracted to like the people who are doing these really funny shots and people who are doing these like really like high contrast. I was like kind of like a kid in a candy shop. I'm like, wow, look at what all these people are doing. This is incredible. And um, I didn't know that I had my style yet because I was really like, I wanted to do funny photos and I was kept trying to do funny photos, like looking for the visual puns. And I just was terrible at it. And uh, then I was trying to do, you know, this or that. And eventually I just decided, okay, none of this is working. You just have to go with like, like, what do I really feel? What draws me? What do I like? What do I see that, that talks to me and resonates? And uh, it was just really kind of listening to, listening to that and working with that and really kind of just being like very true to, to my heart and what was pulling me. And I eventually just completely created my style. Um, it wasn't intentional. It was very organic because I realized being intentional about trying to see what I wanted to say didn't work. So I just kind of became very intuitive. For me, I, I, I like to think of myself as someone I'm really sensitive to the core. I'm really sensitive and I feel everything. So I work mostly based on that. It's not, I don't, I don't even know that I categorize myself as having a certain type of style I've heard and I've listened to people describe my work, especially along the lines of it being just raw. I just, I, I photograph what I'm, what I'm feeling, what, what draws me and at that moment. So, and I feel like I'm just at the beginning of my photography career as well. So I'm, con I'm learning and I'm learning and I'm, I'm learning myself. So I don't know that I can really be specific to, to say that I have this one style or, um, that I've developed this certain type of, of way of, of photographing um, because I started with street. I feel like now I'm moving more into uh, documentary work and then who knows um, what else. So it's more about just like what I'm feeling and what I want to create. You know, New York was hit real hard by COVID, especially early on. You know, I saw the pictures and the videos of the streets just being empty. So for a street photographer, it's definitely a challenge. How did you guys sort of deal with that time in terms of your, your creativity and your, you know, being able to have your usual outlet. How did you contend with that? I was, I was so bummed out, like, like with the entire world, I was, I was sad. I was bummed out. I, um, I do collages. So I started to dabble into collage and like painting and collaging. I was in the house for about a month when we were on lockdown. I work for nonprofits on the front lines. So I had to be back on the streets after that month. And I just kept telling myself, like, how am I supposed to photograph people with masks? Like, like, oh, this is so, like, so unattractive. Like, how am I supposed to capture a mood, a face or anything? I'm not going to be able to do this. Like, that was really my attitude. And I was like, re really critical. Like, I wish I would have been more um, on the streets, taking more photographs if I knew this was going to happen and so on and so forth. And it happened that on that very first day that I was out and I had to go into my office during my break, I decided to walk the financial district, which that's where one of our offices um, is at. And I found this man standing against a wall and just the way the light was hitting him and that was it. And then I said, you see mask or no mask, you're going to make it happen. <laughs> that was it for me. 
Yeah, I I wasn't so happy with the mask situation. I really, really miss seeing people's faces and seeing expression. And um, I didn't like it, but I kept going out to try. And I felt like I just have to keep going out and trying. And even if I didn't take a picture, at least I was going out to try and thinking maybe something will happen. It never, and nothing ever really happened. I think I have about maybe three photos from the last year that I would, that I like, and I haven't even uploaded any of them to the computer or anything. I haven't, I had took a bunch of film. I haven't developed it. It's just kind of like a non-year for photography for me, which is okay. Cause I've been doing it long enough now. I think like it was fine to take a little break. And um, unlike a lot of people, my job changed in February, right before the lockdown and got really, really, really busy. So I was pretty much have been head down for the last year with work work. So it kind of worked out okay. But um, at this point, I am so eager to get out there and start taking photos again. It's just, I just, it's, it's all I'm really thinking about. So soon, hopefully. Do you think that at this time, whether you were going out making a lot of pictures or, 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 or none for a period of time, do you think that sort of shifted your perspective in terms of how you see or how you'll be making photographs when things return, quote unquote, to normal? I'm not, I'm not really sure. I don't know what to expect. I think I, I really have no, no idea what to expect. <laughs> I mean, I kind of feel like it'll just be, I'll find my old groove, but maybe not. I, I mean, I'm definitely a diff different person after this year. I think the city's going to be different after this year. So it's kind of hard to say. It's a good question. I admit that YouTube can be a good photography resource, especially when it comes to equipment and gear. It can also be a place to find out about photographers and their work. If you're discerning enough, you can find voices on that platform that provide good, solid information and inspiration for you to grow as a photographer. But YouTube is a format that is designed to provide content within a sweet spot of about 10 to 15 minutes. The goal of the algorithm and the content creators is to find a way to grab your attention and hold on to it until the end of that time. That's the game. Though it can educate, it's more about entertainment and the power of personality. A good photo monograph provides something that the best YouTuber can never provide. It's an invitation to have an intimate and personal experience with a photographer. It's a conversation that begins, ends, and begins all over again every time you place that book on your lap and turn its pages. It's a wonderful experience that's a combination of leisure and stimulating thought. If you want to have just such an experience but have never known how to start, I recommend joining the Charcoal Book Club. It provides the perfect starting point for discovering work of photographers that will influence you even if they practice a different genre of photography. That's what I experience every time I receive a new book from the Charcoal Book Club. These special first edition books, they're carefully curated, showcasing some of the best talents in contemporary photography. If you want to find a new and different way to propel your photography, the best decision is to become a Charcoal Book Club member today. They offer free shipping to the U.S., Canada, and the U.K. It's subsidized elsewhere. And if you're not feeling that month's selection, that's okay. You can swap it out for a different one of similar value. Visit their website to see what they've offered in the past and what you have to look forward to. Join the club at charcoalbookclub.com today. And remember to use the code THECANDIDFRAME at checkout and receive a 10% discount on your first membership payment. And thanks to those of you who financially support The Candid Frame. Your belief in what we do means the world to us and has helped us through many growing pains. I can't thank you enough. But if you're a listener who hasn't done that yet, you can help contribute to our work by becoming a Patreon supporter today. You can do that by contributing $5, $10, $20 or more a month by visiting patreon.com forward slash The Candid Frame. Just $5 a month from you could make a big difference. 
Thank you so much for your kindness and your help. I've been off of the streets now pretty much for since the, be- you know, the beginning. We take care of my mother-in-law. She's 87, 88. So she's at, she's at risk. So I just, we just didn't feel it was a good thing for me to go down to my usual spot. So I've been doing, you know, some personal work, but it's been, I, I, I think last week I was just really feeling the itch. I was really getting irritable. I just wanted to just, just get both shots on the same day and just get the hell out there and it starts making some photographs. But I, I kind of think that having not done it actively, I, I'm have, there are two feelings I'm experiencing. One, a great level of insecurity in terms of going back there and making photographs and worrying about, you know, have I lost whatever skill and talent that I've developed over these many years? And will I be able to get back into making a good photograph? And just and just getting and and getting back that confidence about interacting and navigating around people. Because you know, I think people, even if they get their shots and stuff like that, there's going to be uh, a hypersensitivity to proximity that didn't exist before all this happened. Like you said, I have no idea how that's going to how that's going to happen because I'm I like I like getting close. I like getting in with a 28 millimeter or 24 millimeter and getting within three feet. And not that I'm like assaulting people, but you know, with a 24 millimeter, I can sort of negotiate myself around them without them necessarily being conscious of the fact that I'm there, you know, and, and make, and make the, and make the photograph. And it's like, there's a whole lot of nervous, nervousness, self doubt, insecurity that's coming up uh, as I start thinking increasingly about uh, getting back out there. So, which is one of the reasons I, I ask you the question, because I, especially in New York, where the <laughs> dynamic is so different from L.A. How about you? You made a face, uh, Emily, when I mentioned it. So, right, I, because I, I was going to say, just come to New York, where even though <laughs> this is happening, people have no, you know, respect for space. Everybody, I was just out earlier and everybody's really just on top of everybody still, you know, walking normally like next to you. So that was a worry of mine of, okay, once we go back to some normalcy or whatever it's going to be, you know, our people are going, going to be extremely apprehensive of being close to other people. I know I am. I'm like, please, you know, give me my space, but I'm out here and it, it doesn't seem that way. Everybody has their masks and they're moving along. I think like a true New Yorker just, you know, we keep fighting and keep moving and keep going. <laughs> you guys are moving so fast. It kind of doesn't matter. Right. It's true. <laughs> I can't catch it. I'm like 10 feet away. <laughs> One of the interesting things about looking at, um, at, at the book uh, and looking at the photographs there, because even though there's just like one singular photograph for each for each photographer, I was really taken by how so many of them were photographing like human interactions, either with other people, like reacting to someone else, or somehow that they were somehow connected to the environment that they were in, and that. It wasn't just about, oh, here's an interesting scene and let's just plop an interesting character or a subject that serves as just as a visual counterpoint. That it's always, they it seemed that so many of the images were about relationships in one form of an, a, another. And I'm really curious in terms of when you guys had the chance to take a look at the images in the book, was there anything that you saw that you felt like that you picked up on? Uh, in, in any particular way that gave you a greater appreciation for not only the work that you were looking at in the book, but for what you were doing yourselves. All it makes me think about is just how awesome women are. <laughs> like <laughs> that's, that's just really my whole focus on these amazing images and stories. And then just motivating me to create bigger and, and, and better works so I, I know that doesn't specifically answer what you're saying, but I'm more asking. But for me, it was just like, wow, how awesome are we? And it doesn't matter where we are in the world. <laughs> Women are always going to prevail one way or another. Yeah, I, I think that was a really interesting observation. Um, 
I was just shocked by how strong, like each image, like one after the next, like just great collection of images. And I felt like there's a certain feel of, um, I know this word gets overused a lot, but there was so much authenticity with, with each image. Yeah. And I didn't like, I look at a lot of street photography and I see a lot that feels very derivative. Like everybody wants to shoot like tall lighter, or, you know, there's a lot of, of derivative. And I, I feel like, this completely just skipped right over that. A lot of feelings of authenticity. And I also think it was such a, such a brilliant move to have everybody's story with the image. Yeah. That like, we just never see that. There's always so much mystery and someone will put like a, you know, profound lyric with a song, but just to have like the personal experience of, of taking the photo, I think is really has had a really big impact. When I look through Instagram, there are a lot of images in there that I think are that are technically well done. Right? They're nicely composed, they use great light. But as I'm swiping through there, I'm waiting for an image that makes me go, oh, you know, something that gets me to vocalize, you know, and go, oh my God, that is so good. And it goes so beyond anything that the photographer was doing technically. And there's something, and you just said it, that sort of genuineness, you know, that the, the sincerity of the image that I think is really tied to how the photographer not only sees the moment, but like you were saying, Emily, how the photographer felt the moment, right? And that's a really hard thing to achieve in a photograph. But I suspect that each of you have had that moment. And when you think about, about one of your pictures where you feel that, what, what, why, you know, what is it about the moment and how you responded to it that makes you, when you see the image that you feel like it does have that genuineness that goes beyond anything that you did technically. Can you guys can describe any aspect of that that helps you to understand when it is definitely working for you yourself as a photographer? I mean, that's kind of my standard when I'm, editing or sequencing, if I feel that little excitement, or if I go, oh, you know, if I have that with my own work, then then that's a photo that I will share or put into my body of work. But it doesn't happen very often. So I share images not that frequently. At first, I was sharing an image every single day. And now it's like maybe 10 a year if I'm lucky. And it's it's kind of a profound thing. And I don't really know what it is that what, what it is that speaks to a person when they have that reaction to one of their own photos. It's kind of esoteric. It's just when everything works together for me, it just, when it just, everything is just has a, a certain dynamic and it sings and it expresses what I was feeling at that time. That's when I get my little, Oh, and I know that you really, you touched on it earlier, that it's all about feeling for you. But can you can uh, expand on that a little bit, Emily? Well, when you're when you posed the question, it made me think about a particular photograph that I took during one of the Black Lives Matters protests that I attended, which uh, this photo is two officers, well, three officers and one African-American officer in the background putting a fire out. And it was one of those moments where I saw myself, myself creating the image because it moved me so much. And I just knew that it would do that, you know, for others. To me, it was like the irony of, you know, even in the middle of a crisis, here is a Black man having to save himself and others as as well. And in regards to, you know, when I maybe post or when I'm looking at my my work, I don't post or I don't show if I myself don't feel strongly about it, if I don't feel that it's going to be meaningful. But I mean, meaningful to me because everybody's going to have their own perspective or their own, you know, thoughts on the work. So if I have, for me, it's just, if I have a message, if I feel strongly about it, then here you go. Here's my work. Tell me about how you guys work technically. Uh, personally, I tend to favor going out there with just one camera, one lens, you know, like a 
35 or 24 or something like that and and just more batteries and because i like i like keeping it simple i don't want to think about having to switch a lens or anything like that but what what work what work what have you found that works for you guys in terms of the technical side mine is the same i'm not i'm not really a technical person i have uh one camera i take it an extra battery and let's go half have fun. I take that camera everywhere. My father let me borrow his camera recently, which is um, way more upgraded than the one I have. So I've been using, I've been using that, but I'm not, I'm not big on, on the technical. Yeah. I have been using the same camera and same lens for eight years. And I, I'm probably the one thing about the pandemic is I'm probably going to finally get a new camera, but it just to become so familiar with a camera and to know it so well and to know the lens so well i just i can't imagine not not doing that it's been like it, it's just become a part of my hand and a part of my brain in a way i'm always amazed people are always changing cameras and changing lenses and upgrading and changing and i mean that's great for them but it's just not oh, it's not my style at all yeah, I don't want to have to think about my camera. If I get a new one, yeah. I'm going to spend most of my time trying to figure that damn thing out. Yeah. Even so if it's true. just a one model up, all of a sudden, I remember I <clears throat> had been using an X100S and I got, I think, and I got the F and like, and I was in Paris. And for the first three days, I was missing shots because the difference in terms of the delay between you pressing the shutter and actually taking the picture, there was a difference. And I was just cursing for two or three days because I had just gotten into this rhythm with the older camera that I didn't even think about because I just knew when to press the button and when to expect it to take the picture. And it was like, oh, you know. So that's why I kind of like I live with the camera. And once it works for me, I live for it for the long time. Um, yeah. Do you guys prefer to work alone? Or yes. I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> you were just bam. <laughs> I feel like you finish. I'm like by myself. So why I, I, I'm part of, you know, two different collectives. I mean when women street photographers, but they don't go on walks. The other they've done several walks and I hate it. Because it's like, first of all, we're all like racing, you know, to find this moment or or what's happening and it's just, it's not, it's not what I like, which is intimate and quiet and therapeutic. Um, and just as this beautiful moment for myself where I'm, I'm finding myself and I'm looking for the things that, that I love and that interest me, you know, versus having five people around me or God forbid you tell me, take a picture of that. You know, I, Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. if I if I if I go out with a group of people, it's like okay, I I, I don't have any expectation that I'm going to make anything of any significance. I'm there to socialize at that point. If I happen to make a picture, it, it's okay. But there's only I think there's probably two photographers that I will go out with because we both understand each other. We'll kind of we'll 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 meet and then we'll sort of wander off and do our things. And during the time we're out there, we'll cross paths, check in again, and then we'll just kind of go on our own thing. But, you know, being side by side the entire time. Oh, hell no. You know, <laughs> hell no. That just, cause like you said, it just takes you out of it uh, completely. Uh, and yeah, like I say, I want, I want to be in the moment. And if that person's next to me, I, I'm going to be inclined to start talking, not looking. Yeah, my boyfriend's a photographer too, and um, he's a street photographer, but doesn't really kind of like street photography without people. So we can go out together, and we're not jostling for the same thing. So because he takes pictures of like tra trees and trash cans um, and birds, and um, but with the street vibe. Uh, Eric Kogan is his name. He's really good. So we definitely go out, and we'll kind of diverge he'll get stuck on something and i wander away or he wanders away so it's kind of this in and out together but not together and that works but going out with a group is just awful it's just i mean i do think it's interesting to see how other people shoot yeah i, I do think that's interesting and i have learned from seeing some people how they shoot i think that's interesting but in terms of getting photos no 
Social, yes. Get photos, no. One of the things I love about what Gonara is doing is with the exhibitions, because they, you know, you can look at a photograph on a screen or on your phone or on a tablet, and it looks great. But there's just something about seeing it on a piece of paper. And when I get a funny when I, when I get around to finally printing some of my photographs, I can't help but just stare at that thing because there's something about looking at one of my own photographs on that on that paper with a nice white border around it that makes me feel it makes me feel complete. But all of a sudden, I'm just looking at it. So I'm experiencing it in a completely different way. And I love to hear about your experiences in terms of, you know, when you saw your work on that exhibit and you saw it on the wall and you saw that image on a piece of paper. What was your experience of your own photograph being being up there? Well, well, for me, I couldn't stop smiling. I got emotional because, like I said, I'm so sensitive. So tears. I was on the first floor right in the middle of of the of the room and I was you know I was just in awe like wow like that's that's my work up there and I felt I felt very proud it was a very proud moment for me yeah I I just felt so honored to be in the company of so much great work and I thought that the way that she sequences the whole show is so smart and it looks so good and I just felt like I mean, yeah, it's great to be able to look at your photo and kind of your own photo and kind of be able to like enter it in a way that you can't when you're looking at it on the screen. But it was also just this, the impact of being amongst all this great work that was so cohesive because of the way she curated the show. You, know, you guys are both in New York, which I love being. And I hear so much advice about, you know, if you're going to go to New York in terms of street photography. And, and I'd love to get a suggestion from each of you that has nothing to do with where to go or when to go, but it's more about, you know, if you're going to shoot on the street of New York, keep this in mind, either about something to be sensitive about. It could be anything, but something is, is directly related to your own experience on the street making photographs. That's a good question. I would say like the, Light's really important. And so kind of positioning yourself in a part of town where if light is important to you. Um, so kind of just make sure you start in a place where the, the light is going to be happening because the light is so special in New York, as you know, and it's just bouncing all over the place and coming in through streets. So definitely pay attention to like placing yourself where there's going to be light that suits your needs. And then also just, walk just walk and walk and walk and like if you can just prepare to walk it's amazing (laughs) just to be able to walk like 10 miles through the city you find so many different things and that's that's all I got there (laughs) I mean I think I would advise you to explore places that you've never been to um, when you visit I think that would be not your, you know, normal 42nd Street, 34th, you know, where everybody likes to to go and photograph. I would advise that you come to the Bronx. (laughs) My sister lives in the Bronx. I love the Bronx. (laughs) Yeah, that's a wonderful advice because that's one of the things that I'm I'm hoping to do next time I'm there is, is really kind of forego Manhattan and go to the Bronx. Go to Brooklyn, go to Queens, maybe go to Staten Island, even though, you know, I have no idea what's there, but it's certainly different from what I'm used to. I got a lot of family in the Heights and that place is just, it's not what it used to be. So it's just kind of like all the things that kind of attracted me to that photographically is like, oh, wow, this is just turning into another suburb, unfortunately. But I'm not, I'm not going to get on, on that soapbox right now. <laughs> Yeah, but that's really good advice. And I used to just get on a subway and just kind of randomly take it and get off and not really know where I was and just explore, which, so I think that's like very good advice. And what's a good safety tip? Because a lot of people are always concerned with, you know, safety in terms of being a street photographer, especially in New York. What would be a, a good suggestion? Be respectful. You know, if you if you're aiming to to capture someone and you see that the energy is not there and the person doesn't want their photo taken or, you know, 
something along those lines, just be respectful and, and, and don't and keep it, keep it moving. Or if somebody says, did you take my picture? Uh, no, I did not. And keep moving. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think that respect is, is super important. The only people I know who've had confrontations and problems, they've just been more aggressive in their style. And like, I know people who've been beaten up, <laughs> but um, it's like, they're really aggressive and in the face. And if someone says like, don't take my picture, like I can take your picture if I want to kind of, kind of thing. So just don't do that. Don't be a jerk. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. And, and my, my advice is don't just don't be sneaky. Cause if you're being sneaky, you look like you're doing something wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm sneaky cause I don't like to break the moment, but then I've also will like, nod at the person if they see me smile sometimes i'll ask if they want to see the photo it's like there's sneaky but then as soon as you get like seen then it's like a different story oh yeah so my last question that i ask each guest is i ask them to recommend another photographer for our listeners to discover and explore and it can be anyone someone you've long admired or someone you've recently discovered so who would the photographer be and why well, I've already um, given a shout out to my partner, Eric Kogan, and I recommend looking at him because he has such a unique eye and he's so talented and so creative and he, there's so much joy in his photos and they're very surprising. So Eric Kogan, you can find him on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have many, but I am going to go with Donna Scruggs amazing fashion uh, photographer, very different obviously than what I do, but I love her tenacity. I love her just drive and honesty. She loves to share information and, and I like that. Um, she's not a gatekeeper. I feel like when people get to certain places, you know, they don't want to share the information. They don't want to tell you how they were able to do this, that, and the other. She has literally sat down and said, hey, you know, not to me, like on Instagram for the world, like you can find someone's email and send your work and reach out. Like she, to the T will, just give advice and give information that is, is vital to photographers and artists who are trying to make it. So I just, I love how giving she is and she's just extremely talented. Well, thank you for the recommendations and thank you so much for your time. I really enjoyed talking with you. Yeah. Thank, thank you. That was great. So nice. It wasn't as bad as I thought it would be. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to Melissa and Emily for joining us. You can find out more about them and their work by visiting melissabriar.com and Emily on Instagram at emily.sujay. If you're a devoted listener and subscribe to the show, write us a review on whatever service you listen to podcasts. Those reviews allow us to grow. And remember, you can support the show by contributing to our Patreon effort or make a one-time or recurring donation via PayPal. Thanks to Robert D. Demers and Chandra Ochberger for their recent contributions. I'm also going to be leading my Using Your Life to Jumpstart Your Photography online workshop next month. Find out more by clicking on the link on the website or the show notes or visit nobechicreative.com. We also provide a series of ebooks on photography available for purchase on our website. It's my way of sharing my experience and knowledge and another way for you to support the show. And if you can't find every episode of the show on whatever service you listen to podcasts, download the Candid Frame app, which is available for Apple iOS and Android. And because of your generosity, it's free to download and use. No additional purchases are required. The Candid Frame's audio engineer is Martin Taylor, who you can find at theothermartintaylor.com. The show's senior producer is Cynthia Parker. And our music is from Kevin McLeod, whose royalty-free music can be found at incompetech.com. And this is Ibadian X, and this is The Candid Frame.